Good afternoon to our viewers joining our session on sustainable corporate governance and stakeholder capitalism. And a good morning to our panel guests, speakers from the uh, United States. My name is George Lachos, and I'm a corporate governance professional and a member of uh, the Corporate Governance Committee of uh, American Hellenic Chamber of Commerce. I'll be your host and moderator for this session today titled uh, Sustainable Corporate Governance and Stakeholder Capitalism. Uh, it aims uh, this session to explore how corporations, our days and business can ensure, uh, first of all, delivering sustainable corporate governance for wider value return, and uh, secondly, how they are committed to their promise on stakeholder capitalism. The spotlight uh, is definitely uh, on uh, uh, in, uh, is definitely on the stakeholder capitalism, our days and stakeholder capitalism is here to stay that's uh, that's for sure uh, and uh, we have uh, the world economic forum the national business council business roundtable and uh, united nations sustainable development goals initiatives uh, and are champion the principle of capitalism the public is also putting pressure as we heard also in the previous panel for companies to create a wider value and the business community has begun to rethink capitalism by realigning their corporate values, purpose and mission with sustainable strategies and ethical business models. Basically, companies should be thinking about what kind of uh, relationship they should have uh, with all stakeholders and how board and, of course, management should approach and adopt stakeholder capitalism. In practical and in particular, we are be talking a close look and we're going to see today what organizations need to be doing to meet the changing expectation on the matter, and especially for corporate governance and stakeholder capitalism model. To discuss this important topic, we have uh, together with us three distinguished guest speakers from the United States of America, and I'd like to start introducing them. We have uh, Mr. Peter Georgescu, an author and corporate governance professional. Peter is a business executive uh, author and speaker devoted to income equalities and opportunity for all Americans. Uh, Peter has been a leading proponent of business governance uh, transition from uh, shareholder primacy to stakeholder capitalism. He's a chair of Emeritus and uh, of uh, Young and Rubicam, a listed company, one of the biggest marketing agencies worldwide. And he served uh, on eight public companies and continues to be a vice chairman of uh, the uh, Presbyterian Hospital and member of the Council of Foreign Relations. Uh, he has authored three books, uh, The Capitalist Arise, the first book, a book that shows how the short-term thinking and uh, shareholder primacy lies on the root of our current economic uh, malice and social breakdown. The, th the second one is the source of success and the third, the uh, constant uh, choice. Also, we have with us uh, Mr. Paul Thanos, Director uh, for Finance and Insurance Industries of the United States uh, Commerce Department in the International Trade Administration. Paul is responsible for developing and executing uh, policies and initiatives of ESG, investing and access to finance. Uh, he's in charge of policy solutions to new economies such as digital identity an important uh, topic, uh, the future of work and how blockchain also technology impacts international trade and competitiveness. He leads the uh, USA uh, delegation to OECD for insurance and private pension. And he's the head of uh, the advisory council for the commercial pillar between United States and UK, United Kingdom financial innovation. And he is also involved with Withdraw Wilson uh, International, the famous one. We uh, also have Mr. Byron Laughlin, Global Head of uh, Board Engagement from NASDAQ. Byron is the Global Head of Board Engagement in NASDAQ, uh, Governance Solution. He's the founder of the Center of Board Excellence. And uh, Byron is recognized in the governance community of his experience in advising board chairs, board committees, director, and executive management teams in a full range of sustainable and corporate governance uh, matters. Uh, I'd like to start this uh, conversation with the first question. Uh, so to get started, I'll begin asking, uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Georgescu. Uh, big business and uh, institutional investors 
are under pressure on the issue of uh, stakeholder capitalism today. But how you will, uh, Peter, define the stakeholder capitalism? Can you provide to us uh, your perspective on this? <coughs> and then we'll go Paul and Byron. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, George, and uh, my fellow colleagues, Paul and Byron. I'm looking forward to this conversation a great deal. And I would like to take a, just a small step back and revisit the notion of capitalism because it's been challenged. It's been challenged from the right, it's been challenged from the left. People say socialism is better and so forth. So what the heck is capitalism anyway? And I think it may be helpful for us to start there. And I will assert that capitalism as an economic system has been proven to be clearly the most successful producer of prosperity and growth than we humans have ever created. So I think that is a historical and economic fact. And so from my way of thinking, we should think of capitalism as an engine, uh, as an economic engine where if a company has access to capital, has access to sustainable, if, if you will, sustainable, uh, way of accessing any number of uh, resources, financial resources, capital human resources, anything that, uh, that uh, a corporation needs to, uh, to work, to continue to work, a sustainable supply chain, for example. If it has access to those resources, those ingredients, and if it uh, in incorporates a few basic principles like prudent risk-taking, uh, a wise use of incentive and rewards, and importantly, to consider investments in research and develop and basic research where that is appropriate. If you put that Boya best together, you end up with capitalism. And wherever that company may be located, it will produce extraordinary prosperity and growth. So that's capitalism. It's an engine-like thing it produces it, but what it doesn't have is an ethical or moral component to it. And that's where governance comes into play. And, yes. Yes, please. And governance, to just finish in a second, governance is, if you will, identifies the purpose of who the beneficiary is, who should receive the value and benefit of what this beautiful engine can produce. And that's the purpose of governance. And it, there are different, different ways to do it. Let's be sure that we understand that China is a capitalist economy where the beneficiary is the Communist, uh, communist Party, which is fine. Different, different uh, uh, if you will, governances exist, existed in America. Cheryl the primacy, the Cheryl got everything. That was the, that was the governance. Now we're talking about stakeholder capitalism, and that's the difference. Stakeholder capitalism, multiple stakeholders. You can have a few, but you only start with the customer, because if you don't take care of the customer, nothing else matters. The workers, the shareholders, the company itself needs to be a stakeholder, a very critical stakeholder, because companies must change, adapt, respond to competitive environment, the change in consumer values. Then you have the communities in which the company does business and of course the larger community our planet so that's how i think of stakeholder capitalism and the latter the companies need to take into consideration and optimize not maximize optimize those seven critical stakeholders so that's my view of what stakeholder capitalism is thanks peter for that crystal clear uh, uh position I, I like to, uh, to attend the same question for uh, uh, for Paul uh, uh, so Paul what, what's what's your uh, I, uh, what your your input how will you define the stakeholder capitalism nowadays from your perspective <laughs> thank you George and it's really great to be here uh, with with Peter and Byron uh, you know I think Peter gave a pretty good sort of picture of, of stakeholder capitalism. There's just a couple things, uh, you know, I would add. First, you know, there's probably no one 
folks, you know, one definition for the topic or the issue of stakeholder capitalism. Um, this is certainly a topic that's top of mind in the United States now. You know, yesterday there was a the annual hearing in the U.S. Senate of the uh, banking CEOs. So all of the CEOs from the from the top U.S. banks do their annual hearing. The first question the CEOs got from the ranking member um, was about stakeholder capitalism, not other issues that are important to banks, but it was about this topic. So obviously it's very top of mind. Um, so if, if I were to sort of define it, uh, probably the best way would be that it's you know, related to a, either a, a business framework or a business strategy that where there's accountability, not only to shareholders, but to stakeholders. And then, you know, you may ask the question, well, who are these stakeholders? Who are we talking about? Well, those stakeholders can be customers, employees, probably the customers, as, as Peter mentioned, is the probably the top one, but customers, employees, communities, suppliers, but also shareholders. You know, one of the misinterpretations of this whole concept of stakeholder capitalism is shareholders are, are basically not important. And, and I don't think that's true. I think they're still important, but so are these other uh, groups, um, organizations, entities, et cetera. Um, you know, Peter also referenced this stake uh, shareholder primacy, which, you know, I think to some extent uh, derives from uh, 1970s with uh, Milton Friedman, the University of Chicago. Um, and, you know, to some extent, I think shake, uh, stakeholder capitalism uh, rebuts Friedman's uh, concept, you know, a corporation should increase shareholder value, but shareholder value should not be looked at uh, in isolation. Um, and, you know, think through what may be a viable business model today may not necessarily be viable in a decade or two, depending on changing economic and environmental conditions. So, so bottom line, stakeholder capitalism, I believe, encourages companies to take a more holistic look at the communities they operate in and understand their actions may have an impact beyond the quarterly bottom line. Thank, thank, thanks for all that. That's, that's uh, also another clear positioning moving from uh, shareholder centric to stakeholder centric and uh, involve uh, and uh, bring value for all uh, stakeholders important and she are uh, the big institution financial institutions also in the united states moving to that direction now i want to go to uh, to byron byron is it's a uh, is uh, have deep uh, in the market so have a, also his opinion about the stakeholder capitalism and how you see also this uh, uh, overall framework of that byron well thank you george and thank you it's a it's a pleasure being here with this group today, I, I um, am enjoying being with Paul and Peter and you, George. Um, first, I'd like to say thank you for um, hosting this uh, and thanking the chamber for host hosting this because, you know, when I when I think about it, here we are in uh, virtually in Greece, one of the birthplaces of governance in our world today and a uh, and and really a place that we all grew up learning about modern governance through the ancients in Greece and i think that's relevant in, in what we're talking about because we're we're a part of an evolutionary process and what uh, what i hear peter and paul emphasizing is this is part of the evolution of of capitalism we um we learn from from what occurred in Chicago back in the 70s. But going before that, when we look back in the 50s around the world of business, you know, Drucker and, and Deming and those folks who were leaders at that time, th they were really advancing a, a type of stakeholder capitalism that we're talking about, 
we did kind of detour for a while in the in the 80s and, and 90s. I think that was a part of the, when I go back and look at the history of it, I've been watching documentaries and I find this relevant because there were things going on in society, you know, in the United States, it was post Watergate. We, we were looking for reasons to find a way out of things that had occurred in the seventies, Vietnam, Watergate, and these all, uh, these kinds of things. And we found that business was one of the drivers or engines as, as Peter described it to, help us emerge and to also take this kind of capitalism around the world. I think what's important about what we're talking about today is we're not trying to undervalue any of the members of the stakeholder groups. In fact, we're trying to elevate them. And to those shareholders, I mean, certainly the shareholder is near and dear to the NASDAQ heart because we don't have a business without the shareholder and that's that's i'm a i originally was an a an entrepreneur so my first thoughts were in terms of starting a company i do i i like the way peter frames this because the company is important and the company's bigger than the founder i founded two companies and pretty quickly i realized that the company was a lot bigger and a lot more important than my ego because it's not going to grow very quickly if it's only on my ego. And that's one of the things I think we're wrestling with here, which is also a clear and present um, concept uh, out of Greece that we can learn from is how this emerges to be a better capitalism for the markets to build more resilient markets around the world today. And, and I hope that that's what we're advancing through this conversation now. Uh, thanks, thanks, Byron. It's important that you have uh, uh, your your positioning that the company is more important uh, than the ego of uh, the major shareholder or founders. And you talk also for uh, a, a, a model uh, that the right uh, corporate governance model that the company should have. And this is my next question. Here is my next question. Now I'd like to start uh, again with uh, Peter. So Peter. Uh, in, from your, for your perspective, what, what are the long-term benefits for companies to make the shift from a balance sheet to a value sheet? So we have, we have a lot of talks about to the previous panel about ESG metrics, blah, 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 etc. We have a, a push coming from European Union and with some uh, uh, taxonomy regulation that, uh, that uh, streamlining uh, a lot of non-financial reporting and indicators that help companies to, to move to that direction for more sustainability that would create a wider value for, for the communities uh, and overall. So uh, moving to from a classic balance sheet to, to a value sheet, how you see what, 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 what companies should uh, follow, uh, what, what corporate governance models should follow in order to make this happen? <clears throat> well, I, I think uh, we all um, actually, the three of us are in violent agreement as to the general direction of what stakeholder capitalism means. But it's important for us to understand the basics. And I think the challenge today is to begin to transmit, if you will, or, or move beyond the principle of saying, OK, so we have these seven or so uh, stakeholders that we just defined and talked about. So what do we do next? So now, uh, as a matter of fact, it's interesting because we are in the early stages of a transition to stakeholder capitalism. This is the beginning of the process. It's not the end. We're not even uh, practicing, except that, except this, which is very interesting. The most successful companies probably in the world today have been practicing instinctively stakeholder capitalism for a long time. Plenty of examples of that. Big companies, uh, even some of the banks, financial institutions, retail companies in America, to give you an example, places like a discount retailer to pick on Costco, toughest margins in the world. The way they succeeded is they started with the workers. And they said, why workers? Why are they important? Well, workers are important because they are probably the only people, your employees are the people who can produce increases in productivity, 
and increases in innovation. And in the 21st century, that's, those are the two drivers. You will win in the marketplace if you can drive productivity, if you drive innovation. And only the workers can do that. So what has to happen? Each one of the stakeholders has to be identified. A criterion has to be developed in terms of what does it mean? For example, I'll give you one other example. When we say pay people better, what do we mean by that? It's not, okay, let's raise salaries, everybody, by 20% to take care of uh, and pay people better. That doesn't work. It's not sustainable. So what we're saying is let's pay people out of the incremental value of what they produce. So what we need to do is to encourage workers to produce incremental value. But for the first time in the last 40 years in America, the employees also, not just the CEO on the C-suite, but the employees needs to share in some fashion out of that benefit. So stakeholder by stakeholder, we have to develop criteria for and measurement. Measurement is critical. If you don't measure, if you don't measure something, action, it's not going to happen. So what we need to do now as a next step is to begin to develop criteria for each one of the stakeholders. Each company needs to do that and then begin to measure that, including, as you mentioned, what do we do about environment and climate change? So everything needs to be articulated with purpose and measured. And that's what the next evolution of uh, stakeholder capitalist needs to become. And by the way, as a PS, uh, my friend Byron and I have been hard at work on trying to develop exactly this kind of a criteria. But that's what needs to happen everywhere. But that's that's great, uh, Peter. Thanks. So I, I know that Byron loves measurement, and I'm sure he's going to talk about that uh, later. So I'm going again to to Paul. Uh, uh, Paul, the same question for you. You influence. You, you, you lead, uh, you support the American companies uh, leading uh, the way worldwide in terms of uh, how to approach stakeholder capitalism, and I'm sure you're really involved with the topic. Uh, so uh, what, 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 what uh, the United States uh, advise the uh, companies to do in order to develop the proper models uh, to, in order to, to deliver that? Well, well let me just say that um you know, in terms of long-term benefits for companies shifting from balance to value sheet and, and how that ropes in maybe to the American context. So first, I think companies that a balance sheet and a value sheet approach, again, that doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. Um, and, you know, adopting a value sheet approach, you know, can be challenging for companies. And we're seeing in the you know, maybe in the European context now, there's been a delay in the corporate sustainability uh, reporting requirements in terms of when those need to be implemented and companies and particularly small businesses, uh, you know, need flexibility and you don't want to, you know, I don't think government should be taking actions that, you know, would disempower, uh, you know, shareholders or companies. But obviously when you're moving towards a, a a value approach, there's tremendous long-term benefits, uh, resilience, uh, sustainability, uh, ultimately, I think, greater profitability in the long run. Um, and what's really essential, I think, to a value sheet approach is what uh, is managing risks. You know, I think that's kind of fundamental to this conversation. And, you know, Yale's uh, Judy Samuelson re has re recently written a book about the new rules for business and creating value. And she makes a point that I think it's important about risk analysis bending to embrace the life cycle of products. And I think we're seeing this approach manifest itself now, for example, in the financial services sector. Um, you know, for example, uh, life insurers in the United States have launched an economic empowerment and racial equity initiative focused on expanding access to financial security in underserved communities. And, 
you know, this is also reflected with asset managers and institutional investment um, leveraging their positions as stakeholders or, or as shareholders to influence corporate decision making, corporate strategies. Um, and, you know, implementing some of these changes in the short term, again, could be challenging. Um, but companies are going to need to make these shifts in order to really weather the economic and environmental transitions that will occur due to either climate change or other long term risks. But also, I think it's important that they will be better placed to take advantage of new commercial opportunities. Um, you know, for us, what my team is doing is we've uh, initiated our own uh, environmental social governance initiative. And I know we had a great panel previously that talked about a, a number of issues around ESG, but we're trying to get out in front of this issue and have and talk to uh, to other governments about how they're approaching ESG, but also to create opportunities to highlight American leadership, um, corporate leadership, private sector leadership among businesses that are implementing ESG strategies. So this has been a very exciting initiative we've just launched this year and would be happy you know, later at some point to answer any questions about that. That, th thanks, uh, Paul. I uh, appreciate your uh, input here. It was really uh, valuable. Uh, and, and the same question for Byron. Uh, Byron, I know that uh, NASDAQ is trying to streamline at the global level reporting for ESG and uh, calibrate a global uh, model in order to align different reportings around the world. And uh, I'm sure you're really involved with big companies. Have you, you have evaluated uh, several boards uh, around the world. So what do you advise companies? How should you build the proper uh, stakeholder, uh, 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 stakeholder uh, governance model? What, what do you advise them how to approach it? We're seeing this. Um, yes, we do. We do board evaluation work is what my division primarily does. And in that, we're engaged in the advisory around the things that we're discussing today. One of the areas that we're seeing this is more and more uh, companies are engaging their CHRO or their chief people person at a higher level. And, and this is a common trend that was already occurring before ESG and stakeholder capitalism became popularized, um, although Frankly, I, I, I feel that we pay some homage to Peter. Peter's been on the front edge of this for many years, pushing this. And uh, that's what got me. One of the things that got me going was, was reading Peter's book. And, and what we are seeing is that the, the more resilient companies are engaging this in the way that we're wrestling with it. This, this kind of discussion is happening in more and more boardrooms. And so, but one of the key areas being going back to Peter's emphasis on the workers, this idea, and I want to, I want to focus us on this for, and make sure that we all understand what Peter said, and that is, the investor invests in a company. That thing that they're investing in is innovation primarily, regardless of what kind of company it is there's well let's go back to the video that we watched at the beginning with from um the hellenic petroleum company much of that video was innovation and in that innovation what we need to immediately see are workers innovating and being inspired by investment to do that innovation that viewpoint it's it's a shift it's a modern day shift of looking at the worker as the person who drives productivity and innovation and management helps foster it so that people feel that freedom and that energy to create like that. You know, an interesting thing a banker said to me when a, a year ago, a, a bank, a, one of the largest banks in the United States, he's the CEO. And he said, and this was partly a comment on innovation. He said, you know, it's amazing, Byron, 12,000 people went home last month and the bank is doing well. Think about that for a second, what that means to us. 
Do we have to trust those workers? Yes. What are we trusting them for? To do their jobs and to innovate when they went home, they picked up their laptops, left the office and went home and commenced each person at NASDAQ. We talked a lot about this during the time. We all became entrepreneurs that day. We had to figure out how everything worked. It was a, it was a little bit of a, we're trying to figure out how Zoom works and, and StreamYard and all these things work today. This is real innovation though, going on in our world today. And we're learning how to whiteboard and to engage innovation through these kinds of processes. We should leave this kind of thing inspired to do more, not only for ourselves, but for our neighbors, our workers, and um, those fellow employees that we're engaging with. And that is front and center to NASDAQ today. You're seeing this through, this is what we hope the SPACs that can emerge to be, come tools for innovation on a more rapid basis. That's hope it works out that way. Very inspiring, uh, uh, Byron, thanks. Uh, so uh, uh, understanding all classes of stakeholders and engage them, especially internal stakeholder at all levels uh, with, a, uh, with a culture glue uh, that, that uh, uh, you know, uh, brings innovation and of course, uh, further engagement and uh, sustainable uh, corporate governance. Uh, uh, another more, a little bit tactical, but uh, I want this time to start with, uh, with, uh, with Paul. Uh, so talking about um, how technological trends such as blockchain technology, Web 3.0, and automation impacting the stake called the capitalism and the future of war, you, you're a specialist on that, Paul. What's your opinion on the matter? Well, I, I, I associate myself with what Byron was just saying about sort of how we're working uh, and how that's changed in the last year or so um, and the profound impact I think that's going to have moving forward uh, in the post pandemic environment also. And it and so future of work, but also some of the trends that that you mentioned in the question blockchain technology uh, web 3.0 I think they're all unified by first a, a common theme of decentralization and you know technology such as blockchain technology distributed computing can operate without the need for uh, necessarily central control and maintenance and you know you know for those of you who may not be that familiar with this now blockchain technology enables uh, you know what we call trustless trust where parties to a transaction, need not know each other for the transaction to be completed. That's basically guaranteed by by the code. And, you know, for blockchain, it's most well known as the technology undermining or, or underpinning Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. But there's a lot of use cases around blockchain technology that directly impact a company's governance and operations. And I think we're going to see more of this in the future. Um, there are major use cases. I think Peter at least touched on a little of this in terms of supply chain when we started this discussion and how important that is for stakeholder capitalism. Well, uh, you know, blockchain technology can help guarantee a company's products are in compliance with environmental and social claims. And this is really important in sectors such as agriculture, um, where more and more stakeholders want to ensure that fair trade practices are, are being followed. Um, blockchain technology can also be uh, deployed to tag and trace the origins of cotton supply. So, you know, you have a consumer market that more and more wants to buy products uh, which they feel are manufactured in a socially responsible way. So these mechanisms can help reassure a buyer of say, for example, a Patagonia code or something else that uh, you know, the, the products being manufactured uh, in a socially responsible way. So now more specifically related to corporate governance too, it was just a couple of years ago where Santander 
became the first company to use blockchain technology for voting at its annual general meeting. Um, and, you know, so here you have another example, decentralization coming in, in the context of governance. And, you know, in the future, blockchain voting systems may allow for a more bottom-up approach to governance sort of in line with, with, with what we're talking about here, stakeholder capitalism. And I also want to make the point when thinking about corporate governance, I think it's really important to think about the impact of what they call smart contracts or self-executing contracts particularly uh, on the Ethereum blockchain. And this can be an, an enormous game changer for how companies in the future will operate, will directly impact governance. And it's getting a lot more attention now as, the, as Ethereum will be rolling out its new proof of, of uh, stake format in this summer. So these are all things to watch. Some are happening already but some are gonna be happening in, the, happening in, a, in the very near future. And it, it all relates, I think, in the end to, it's much more easier now. People have much greater access to information and that is allowing a lot of changes that maybe even 10 years ago were not possible in, in this space and others. Thanks, 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 Paul. Although these challenges, you see some good, uh, good, uh, opportunities and uh, and uh, the, the global uh, the global dynamics uh, can help for uh, the matter uh, the same uh, question for Peter Peter uh, you you uh, according to your capitalist rice book the current economic uh, malice uh, lead to, uh, to to a social uh, breakdown so the same question for you. you 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 believe technology and all new these dynamics how can influence either positively or negatively uh, the stakeholder capitalism for uh, the, the corporate governance model of the companies? Uh, Peter, I think so, you're mute. I'm so sorry. Uh, I, I was so delighted to see Paul go through the, the magic of blockchain as one of today's important new technologies. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But I think we let's think about the issue of technology and what does it really mean? And I want to go then to tie it back into the notion of stakeholder capitalism because that's the foundation. I'm going to come back to that. That's so important. Who created blockchain? Technology didn't do that. Guess who did that? People did that. Employees did that. That's who creates create everything, every new technology that has ever been created has been created by people. At least, now, technology can help, uh, if you will, can, can help in, 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 let's say, artificial intelligence and machine learning can help drive new in, innovations and so forth. But again, at the heart of it is people, trained people, industrious people, entrepreneurial people, who have a motivation and a desire to create new things. And so that's part of the future. But again, if we come back to the notion of what stakeholder capitalism entails, is the in incentive for all the various stakeholders to make a contribution mm -hmm. to creating greater value. Because at the end of the day, the whole purpose of stakeholder capitalism is to increase, not to just share value or to redistribute the pot that already exists. No, the point of stakeholder capitalism is to create greater value. And everybody wins, you see. For people who thought that uh, shareholder, uh, uh, shareholder primacy maximized short-term shareholder profits, they were wrong. They didn't. They left a lot of money on the table because they couldn't maximize the value creation. And stakeholder capitalism is a way, it's one of the current ways that we can think of, of creating greater value for all stakeholders. And at the end of the day, the shareholders should benefit even more 
because the more the employees are committed to create greater value and incented to do that because they will share in the benefits of that. So they have a motivation to create new technologies. Okay, so at the end of the funnel over the long term, which is what value creation is about, long term, not short term, the shareholders should be able to do very, very well. So this, again, every everything that is happening should be incentive, an incentive to create greater value and to create more jobs, greater productivity. And this is the format, or at least the best format that we know today, mm-hmm. that that's why we're encouraging and supporting the notion of the adoption of uh, stakeholder capitalism because it is a powerful platform from which innovation and productivity can flourish. And at the end of the day, again, back to uh, blockchain technology, you see blockchain technology can become, as Paul said, one of the validations and the measurements of how various stakeholders are really performing. So when you evaluate a corporation, you can use some of these things that in fact that stakeholder capitalists have helped, have helped create. Thanks, uh, Peter. That is very uh, sounds very uh, optimistic, and uh, personally, I like it. Uh, so, uh, setting the foundation within the companies with purpose and value, you can stretch uh, more uh, values to share, uh, even from the shareholder. Uh, uh, Byron, you're working in a, in a market operator, but of course, it's a technology company. NASDAQ can involve either with a big, a lot of uh, companies around the world through platforms, etc. So, how you, how you see technology involving with the stakeholders' capitalist model, and how that can influence at the end of the day to to deliver value to all stakeholders and mainly uh, the, this, the the future of the world, as we discussed in the post. Sure. Uh, very, very constructive gave it to us. So I use one prop. This the, this little device that we have is a key part of the technology over the last uh, ten years or so. It's made a- Apple uh, the arguably the the uh, largest company in the world today. And yet, what does this imply? I mean, to to Paul's point about blockchain, there will be blockchain technologies being incorporated to apps on this device. But another thing this device has done, it's connected now roughly 3 billion people around the world. That means that those people, those workers, all of us are in this together more than we've ever been before. We can read about what's happening in COVID around the world in a matter of minutes through various technologies that are loaded on this device. It also means that workers now we all know sort of fair value. We're all figuring this stakeholder piece out in terms of what is fair value. I think that this technology will continue to accelerate the disruption, not only socially, but uh, in terms of the business environment of people wanting to be a part of this. And when I say this, the whole capitalism that Peter outlined at the beginning, so this linkage between technology and governance is an important one for us to wrestle with well, because whoever's controlling this technology in the fir- future will be controlling a lot of what we're talking about. And the, the thing I like about Paul's description of blockchain technology is that there is distributed through this distributed ledger system, there is distributed accountability and that accountability is within the system of blockchain. It's important that this play out well, whether or not it's in healthcare. I mean, we would all like to see increased blockchain technology enter into healthcare and help us figure out how to wrestle with things like pandemics, because we didn't do that. We've wrestled with it okay, but we really didn't do that great a job. I mean, the, the week after the announcement that basically COVID was going global, that was the most confusing week in, in the media I've watched in years. People had almost no idea what was happening in their own way. They, 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 the pundits were looking at each other on news shows and kind of, they were, they were talking, but they were really just throwing their hands up and saying, we don't know where this ends. 
And we should we should have a little better understanding. And I thought that Paul's description of this helped to see that there are ways for us through governance mechanisms. You know, some companies use what's called tabletop exercises is a good example to try to predict the future. This this these new technologies help us predict things that also link us to the last um, to the last webinar session on ESG understanding because we don't the, we don't want to get the e thing wrong if we're not accountable to the e appropriately and we get it completely wrong and we say five years from now oops we got it wrong well it may be a no turning back it appears that COVID we may be addressing and if we had a kind of technology you know we're seeing technology erupt in the midst of COVID because what is happening to my description and all of our description earlier, people are at home figuring things out. They're not just sitting around watching Netflix every night. They're also figuring things out. We're seeing new technologies. We've had more IPOs at NASDAQ in, in the first quarter this year than probably we've had, maybe ever had. So there, that tells me that technology is advancing and that we want to really wrestle with it well, like we're doing today. Thanks, thanks, thanks a lot, Byron. Gentlemen, we're going to our last uh, round of uh, the last question and uh, one round. Uh, it was clear and uh, your positioning that uh, companies or they should in, in incorporate stakeholder for five, six classes, uh, no matter what. Uh, they have to have a resilient uh, strategic uh, plans, uh, incorporate innovation, technology, and of course, they have to build the ethical business model. But uh, what is your faith in the extent to which uh, stakeholder capitalism can build trust among stakeholders and shareholders and to be a force of good, uh, both for society and planet at the end of the day? So, uh, Peter. OK, <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm an optimist. Uh, I think I I don't know if I was born an optimist, but my background convinced me that being an optimist is a good thing. And I think, I think there is something very powerful in the notion of stakeholder capitalism. And, and I think it's more, you know, going back, I, I like the fact that uh, Byron uh, went back and tipped his hat to the Greek heritage and Greek history, because there's something inherently good about the notion of stakeholder capitalism. And that, I think, is the notion of democracy. And what I th mean by democracy is not a political system. It's not the way for us to differentiate from China. But I think it's the aspiration of all human beings for us to all feel that we are participating and are being part of the bigger idea. And this is the notion of creating greater value, using technology, using all of the tools that the human mind, the infinite capacity of women to create new things. But at the end of the day, we also need to make sure that this is not just a game of me winning and you losing. We want to see here increasingly systems, economic systems, and eventually political system, but economic system for sure, which can help create a better environment, a better society for all humanity. And I will, I will say to, to all of us that stakeholder capitalism is one of the tools that is emerging along with other technologies, when it, which in essence can foster, increase the notion of, uh, of democracy and by which I mean creating a better world inclusively for everyone. Great, thanks. Uh, really, really inspiring, Peter. Uh, uh, Paul? your input on the same uh, question. Thanks, George. So, you know, as, as I've been listening to this really, really great discussion, um, first, there's a couple themes here that I think are really critical. Risk, value, accountability. These issues are all directly related to stakeholder capitalism and actually a critical component of why this topic uh, is gonna be with us for a long time. Um, your question mentions trust and 
that is also fundamental. <laughs> but stakeholder capitalism is not going to work if there's not trust among stakeholders, shareholders, and, and the ecosystem. So I think that stakeholder capitalism can help um, you know, shareholders and stakeholders better understand each other's interests, move forward in a cooperative way. Um, you know, in the last 10, 15 years, we've faced multiple crises around the world, uh, going back uh, to the financial crisis, going back to the, which we haven't touched on that much yet in this discussion, but growing inequality, uh, obviously COVID and its impact. Um, and there's a heightened awareness uh, of a lot of other issues out there. Uh, climate change, racial inequities, wealth, of course, wealth disparities, I just mentioned. And one thing that's a little bit troubling is that when you look at surveys, at least in the United States, young people are losing faith in capitalism and they and part of that is because they've lived through the financial crisis they have a lot of student loan debt at least in the u.s um there's not as many good middle class jobs as they used to be and also again the pandemic so when you throw all this together we can't continue i don't believe as business as usual um, you know, a few years ago, I was at a think tank. Uh, I had a sabbatical from the government and I, I was fortunate to be able to write a piece then in 2016 about inclusive capitalism is what we called it then. But I think the more appropriate term now is stakeholder capitalism. Um, and I pointed out some things then, and since then a lot has changed, but some of these issues are still with us and maybe have become a uh, bigger problem. So I don't think stakeholder capitalism should be understood as a trend that's going to subside. Uh, I, I think it's going to be the approach that companies will need to, one, restore the public space in, in markets, two, to prepare for the challenges of the future, and three, to be successful in the future, to create value. Um, so manage risk, create value, and maybe even provide a viable contrast, maybe a, a Western uh, model that maybe would be a little different than other models out there from other countries um, that have more state directed economic planning. Um, and that might be more appealing to some people now because uh, of market failure. So um, I'm excited about this topic and excited to be working on it in a, in a small way. And, and there's just so much more work to do. And, and We'll just have to see what happens. Thanks, Paul. Again, uh, uh, very inspiring uh, your uh, input. So I, I like to close also with Byron's input on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the topic. Well, these two, the two, two area, two items clearly came through today, and that is balance and trust, and and balancing the interests of each of the stakeholders and that each of the stakeholders trust the others. When it's far out of balance, we have things like what happened in 2008 and, and crises. And when they're in balance, we have we see companies flourish and grow. And um, w one of the things I will um, I'll close on is that you know, good governance is a foundation for everything we're talking about whether or not it's over in the political area where i don't spend much time but in the in the but the parallels are replete between the political and the governance in a business and that good governance is foundational to every company whether or not you are doing it intentionally or unintentionally it's going to happen upon you 
or you design it and you can structure it. You know, one of the, the famous sayings in business is structure is your friend. Developing good processes and structures are a friend. That's one of the things we're trying to do together today. And hopefully that there's a sense of feeling ownership of developing good, good governance structures and working together between we're in the United States, but we, we are involved in, in Greece and, and Greece is an important part of the, um, the, the business world to us, to many Americans. But I'll, I'll close on this. This week was Bob Dylan's uh, 80th birthday. Um, I was a child of the 70s and 80s and many of the things that I learned uh, came out of, uh, some of the things I learned came out of Bob Dylan's voice. And then one other, for those of you that uh, know a band called The Police from days ago, but uh, a guy named Sting was the lead singer. Well, I find art and governance need to move together well also. And so the art of these two people touch me in this way. One, the times they are a changing. One of the famous Bob Dylan lines. And if, if you're not changing with them, whether or not it's technology or governance, I, I would offer, go back and listen to more Dylan because he, he, he did a, a good job of predicting a lot about the future, which I find artists do pretty well. And then this, was a, this is a tender line in a Sting song don't the Russians love their children too? And it goes back to when many of us were younger and the idea of, of nuclear war. Why in the world would we do that? It seems absurd. I happen to have written, a, my first job was writing a, a paper on the MX missile. Scared the living daylights out of me. This thing, <laughs> you know, do significant damage. Well, I'll close with this. If we get this right, civilization improves. A fundamental part of, of the ancients in Greece was to help us improve as societies as we emerged and grew. If we don't get this right, shame on us. And, and I think I hear this from Paul and Peter, really shame on us because we have all the tools before us to get this right. So the challenge as leaders is to do well. And as a board member, a leading board member, I was on the phone with two days ago doing a board evaluation. He said, you know what's important about this is doing the right thing. We know how to do it. We know what the right thing is. If you're a reasonably intelligent person, you know what the right thing is, but you got to do it. So doing the right thing is doing the right thing. And that's a lot about, you know, to bring it down to a simple phrase, I don't know if that's a common phrase in Greece. Uh, George teaches me these kinds of Greek phrases. So I'm sure there's a better translation than just doing the right thing is doing the right thing. But it is core to governance is having that, um, is that sense of we're doing the right thing. And I think that that's what stakeholder capitalism is about today. So thank Jennifer, you, George. Thanks. thanks a lot. It was really inspiring. Uh, 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 we ran out of time, unfortunately, so I'd like to conclude with one sentence. Uh, uh, sustainable corporate governance is simply the forerunner of the new era, era of uh, stakeholder capitalism, and stakeholder capitalism is here to stay, and we are responsible to make this uh, happen. We really appreciate uh, your valuable input and your commitment and the good talks uh, and uh, for our country. We appreciate it a lot and we'd like to see you again in all of our panels. So on behalf of our uh, of the American Hellenic Chamber of Commerce, I'd like to thank you, uh, all panel guests, and uh, be with us and share this uh, uh, experience. And I uh, hope you to inspire uh, all of the future of stakeholder capitalism. Uh, thanks to our uh, distinguished speakers, and I want to uh, uh, give the, uh, uh, the, the, the floor, the digital floor, uh, to uh, the next chapter for the new law uh, and the self-regulation approach uh, deriving from Hellenic Corporate Governance Code. So, Mr. Xenophon Ablonitis, Executive General Manager uh, and uh, ex-chair of the Hellenic uh, Capital Market Commission, it's going to host a very uh, three distinguished speakers, Mrs. Nastasia Stamu, Panagiotis, Yanopoulos, and Nikos Dimopoulos. Thanks again for your time and uh, uh, listening to us.